Hello, wonderful people. It's Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my pharmacology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about the arachidonic acid pathway, medications to treat asthma and COPD, heparin, warfarin, antiplatelets, thrombolytics, and even anti seizure medications. As for today, we shall talk about sympathomimetics, the drugs that mimic the sympathetic nervous system. And since sympathetic fibers secrete noradrenaline, therefore the sympathomimetics are agonists on adrenergic receptors, adrenergic from adrenaline or noradrenaline. If the parasympathetic nervous system was about nicotinic and muscarinic receptors, then the sympathetic nervous system is all about alpha receptors and beta receptors. Today we'll talk about alpha and beta agonists, and in the next video we'll talk about sympatholytics, or adrenergic antagonists. Now click the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. This video was made possible through the generous support of Maria, so please take a moment to say thank you to Maria in the comments. Remember that the autonomic nervous system has three parts, parasympathetic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, and enteric nervous system. Parasympathetic is all about rest and digest, but sympathetic is about what? It's about fight flight. So to understand the functions of the sympathetic autonomic nervous system, just imagine yourself running from a tiger. Quick neuro review. Remember when we divided the brain through an imaginary line in the sand? In front is motor, behind is sensory. The same fact applies to the spinal cord. In front is motor, behind is sensory. How about the autonomic nervous system? Well, if I have a sensory fiber, sensory autonomic fiber is going to enter through the afferent, which is posterior, behind the line, because it's sensory. But if I have something to move the gland to secrete, for example, or constrict a vessel, then these fibers will originate from the lateral horn cell in front of the line, because this will be an autonomic motor fiber. The sympathetic nervous system is fight-flight. The parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest, i.e. secretomotor. Sympathetic nervous system is thoracolumbar, but the parasympathetic nervous system is craniosacral. The postganglionic sympathetic fibers secrete noradrenaline, but the parasympathetic fibers secrete acetylcholine. Since noradrenaline is here, we call these adrenergic fibers. Since we have acetylcholine there, we call the parasympathetic cholinergic fibers. Who's gonna be waiting for the adrenergic chemicals? Adrenergic receptors, such as alpha receptors and beta receptors. But who's waiting for the cholinergic fibers? Who's waiting for the acetylcholine cholinergic receptors? I mean nicotinic and muscarinic. So the origin of the sympathetic nervous system is thoracolumbar. And from there, they reach the rest of your body after relaying in ganglia. So I will have a lovely fiber here starting in the spinal cord and then reaching the ganglion. Another neuron will start in the ganglion until I reach the target organ, let's say your heart. The effects of the sympathetic autonomic nervous system were discussed before in my physiology playlist. Let's review them quickly. Imagine that I am running from a tiger, fight, flight. What's going to happen to my pupil? Dilates. What's going to happen to my eyelid? Elevates. Skin. I have vasoconstriction of the vessels of the skin. Will I secrete some sweat? Of course. What's going to happen in my thorax? When it comes to my bronchi, they will dilate because I'm running from a tiger, so I need to breathe more. By the same token, I need to see better the danger in front of me and the danger behind me for that matter. As for the heart, sympathetic nervous system will boost heart rate, stroke volume, which means contractility, i.e. it is a positive enotropic, chronotropic, dromotropic, basmotropic, etc. All of the effects on the heart happen because of beta-1 receptor stimulation, but dilation of my bronchi happens thanks to beta-2 stimulation. How do I remember it? Well, you have one heart, but two lungs. So beta-1 is in the heart, beta-2 is in the lung. A better way to remember them is by their importance. Imagine that you are a scientist and you have a receptor on the heart, another receptor on the lungs. Which one takes priority? The heart, of course. So beta 1 is in the heart, beta 2 is in the lungs, as well as other places. In the abdomen, when I'm running from a tiger, I need metabolism. So please, secrete that epinephrine or epinephrine from my adrenal medulla, and this will do what? Well, what does epinephrine do? Epinephrine is anti-insulin. 
Insulin was anabolic, but epinephrine is catabolic. Let's break down your glycogen to glucose to give you energy to run. Let's break down the triglycerides into free fatty acids, i.e. lipolysis. And since epinephrine is anti-insulin, epinephrine will reduce insulin secretion, but will boost glucagon secretion. A very important point indeed. Because this is all about the most important dichotomy in medicine, or distinction, Feeding state versus fasting state. When you're running from a tiger, you are in the fasting state. You're not eating while running from a tiger. You're not in the anabolic land, but in the catabolic land. You're not in the land of abundance, but in the land of scarcity. You're not in the insulin world. Instead, you are in the glucagon world. The insulin world, i.e. feeding state, is anabolic. It's a builder. It builds up amino acids into bigger proteins and builds up the small glucose into bigger glycogen and builds up the free fatty acids into bigger triglycerides. This is in the land of feeding. But when I'm running from a tiger, I am in the land of scarcity, in the land of fasting. So it's not insulin this time, but glucagon. And not just glucagon, glucagon and his friends. Who are his friends? Epinephrine is one of them, cortisol is another one of them, and freaking thyroxine is another one of them. All of them are catabolic hormones for the most part. So when I'm running from a tiger, this is sympathetic, which means my adrenal medulla will secrete epinephrine, which means epinephrine will break down glycogen into glucose, hashtag glycogenolysis. It will break down triglycerides into free fatty acids, which is lipolysis. And if you keep running for days, it will break down your proteins into amino acids, take those amino acids and try to convert them to glucose, especially the glucogenic amino acids. Hashtag gluconeogenesis, genesis, formation, of glucose from new sources. What else happens when I run from a tiger? Well, what are the two most important organs in your body? Heart and brain, of course, or brain and heart. Amazing. So I will boost the blood supply to your brain and to your heart. But what else do you need in order to run from a tiger? I need my skeletal muscles. So I will shunt the blood away from the organs that you do not need right now, such as the skin and the gastrointestinal tract, because we do not have enough time to rest and digest poop and pee in this time. And instead, we shift that valuable blood to your brain your heart, and your skeletal muscles. Which means we will constrict the blood vessels in your skin and gastrointestinal system, but we'll do the opposite. We will dilate the blood vessels in your brain, heart, and skeletal muscles, especially the heart and skeletal muscles. How do you constrict these vessels? Alpha-1 receptor stimulation. How do you dilate other vessels? Beta-2 receptor stimulation. And that's why you need different types of receptors. Cause the same freaking epinephrine can lead to vasoconstriction on some receptors and vasodilation on other receptors, even though it is the same chemical. That's why you need receptors. Something that your great professor will never tell you. The same concept applies to the bladder. The sympathetic nervous system dilates my urinary bladder because I do not have time to urinate when I'm running from a tiger. It will be embarrassing to say the least, if not time consuming and life threatening. So I will dilate the bladder wall. Amazing. And then what? What's going to happen after you dilate the bladder wall? I will do the opposite to the sphincter. I will constrict my urethral sphincter. Oh, how do you dilate something and constrict something? Well, because the bladder has beta receptors, but the sphincters have alpha receptor. Oh, I get it. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the French toast you're talking about. Remember that the output of the heart or cardiac output equals to how fast the heart is pumping times how strong the heart is pumping. Heart rate means how many beats per minute. Stroke volume means how much volume per stroke. When you multiply them together, you get how much volume pumped by the heart in one minute. And if you take that lovely cardiac output, put it here, multiply it by the total peripheral resistance, also known as the systemic vascular resistance, what do you get? I get the mean systemic arterial blood pressure. Today, we're talking about sympathomimetics. Some of them will increase heart rate and or stroke volume. And what's going to happen when you increase heart rate and stroke volume? You increase the cardiac output. And when the cardiac output goes up, what's going to happen to blood pressure? It also increases. How did I raise the heart rate and the stroke volume? Remember that beta 1 is on the heart. 
Oh, so beta-1 stimulation raised the stroke volume and the heart rate and therefore the cardiac output and therefore the blood pressure. Also, alpha-1 stimulation will do what? It will constrict my vessels and when you constrict the vessels, what's going to happen to the radius? The radius decreases. So what's going to happen to the resistance? Resistance increases, including the total peripheral resistance. And when the resistance goes up, what's going to happen to the blood pressure? It too shall increase. So here's cardiac output. It equals heart rate times stroke volume. How fast times how strong. For example, if the heart rate is 100 beats per minute, and the stroke volume is 50 ml per beat. You can just multiply this by this, and we can cancel beat upstairs with beat downstairs. We get the cardiac output in ml per minute. The blood pressure, or the mean systemic arterial blood pressure, to be specific, equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. Beta-1 agonists increase heart rate and stroke volume, therefore increase cardiac output and blood pressure. And alpha-1 agonists increase TPR, also increasing blood pressure. Remember that alpha-1 constricts vessel. When I constrict vessels, the radius goes down, but resistance goes up. Resistance goes up, meaning total peripheral resistance went up. You can think of it also as blood pressure equals force over area. As I constrict the vessel, the surface area decreases, so the blood pressure increases. If I am talking about a sympathetic fiber, I'm talking about the postganglionic sympathetic. But before the postganglionic, we had a ganglion, and we had what? We had preganglionic. Where did we start? It's thoracolumbar. So I started at the lateral horn cell in the thoraco or lumbar region. Then I have preganglionic fiber, which by the way secretes acetylcholine. We call these preganglionic. Since they secrete acetylcholine, they are cholinergic. What's the name of the acetylcholine receptor waiting on the ganglion? That's nicotinic sub N. Then we have the ganglion and postganglionic fibers that are adrenergic because they secrete noradrenaline onto alpha and beta receptors. Cholinergic fibers are nicotinic or muscarinic, but adrenergic fibers are alpha or beta. Here is an adrenergic fiber. Look at this, norepinephrine, postganglionic sympathetic, and then after norepinephrine gets released into the synaptic cleft, it can act on alpha-1 or beta-1. But look, here we have acetylcholine from a cholinergic receptor, such as the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers, secreting acetylcholine because they are cholinergic. Acetylcholine can act on nicotinic receptors or muscarinic receptors. Since today's video is talking about sympathomimetics, we will focus on alpha and beta receptors. What do sympathetic fibers secrete? They can secrete norepinephrine, but not epinephrine. Who secretes epinephrine then? Only the adrenal medulla, because the adrenal medulla goes this way. Phenylalanine tyrosine, dopa dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. Or phenylalanine tyrosine, dopa dopamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline. The adrenal medulla can go all the way until we get epinephrine out. However, if this was a sympathetic nerve fiber, it can only secrete norepinephrine, but it cannot secrete epinephrine. Why not? Because it lacks the final enzyme, which is known as phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase. Only the adrenal medulla possess such an enzyme. Here is the sympathetic nerve fiber, phenylalanine, tyrosine, dopa, dopamine, and then norepinephrine. There is no epinephrine here. Norepinephrine will leave the presynaptic neuron. It will go to the synapse. It has options such as acting on the alpha-1 receptor, on the alpha-2 receptor, beta-1 or beta-2. Let me tell you something. Alpha-2 is anti-sympathetic. How do I remember it? Alpha-2 with a 2, with a T, is anti-sympathetic. And what do I mean by that? If you stimulate the alpha-2 receptor, it will inhibit the release of norepinephrine from the presynaptic neuron. Back to norepinephrine in the synapse. It can act on alpha-1 alpha-2, beta-1 or beta-2, or even beta-3. After it has performed its function, it's time to get rid of it. We can degrade it by COMT enzyme, which stands for catecholamine O-methyltransferase, because norepinephrine is one of the catecholamines. And this breaks down norepinephrine into some metabolites that can get excreted by the kidney. Or, besides breaking it down, we can reuptake it back into the presynaptic neuron, Who's going to take care of it here? The MAO enzyme, monoamine oxidase. We can also recycle it back into the vesicle. Please note that COMT exists in the synapse. 
However, MAO enzyme exists in the presynaptic nerve terminal. Alpha-2 is antisympathetic, right? But how about alpha-1? No, alpha-1 is the sympathetic. What does it do? Well, alpha-1 is a hero of constriction of vessels, contraction of the dilator pupillae muscle to cause medriasis or dilation of the pupil. Stimulation of alpha-1 constricts the sphincters of the GI tract and the GU tract, gastrointestinal and genitourinary. Look, I'm closing the sphincters by stimulating alpha-1. Norepinephrine, for example, is an alpha-1 agonist, which means it stimulates alpha-1 receptors. How about phentolamine and phenoxybenzamine? They are antagonists. They block the alpha-1 receptor. So we're done with the alphas. Alpha-1 constricts vessels, dilates pupils. Alpha-2 is antisympathetic by preventing the release of norepinephrine from the synaptic vesicle. But how about the betas? Betas, for the most part, are inhibitory on everything you can imagine except three things on the heart, on hormones, and metabolism. Because beta-1 stimulates the heart. It increases heart rate, stroke volume, contractility, it's positive enotropic, chronotropic, dromotropic, etc. It is stimulatory on hormones, such as hormones of metabolism. Example, lipolysis. But everything else, beta is inhibitory. It inhibits the contraction of my bronchi, so my bronchi dilate. It inhibits the contraction of gastric muscles and the smooth muscles of gastrointestinal and genitourinary, so they relax. Beta is inhibitory. It relaxes the uterus wall. Can you give me examples of a beta agonist? Epinephrine. Epinephrine is an agonist on beta as well as alpha. How about a blocker of the beta receptors? An antagonist. Any drug that ends in olol, such as propranolol, metoprolol, etanolol, etc. Alpha-1 receptors are GQ-coupled. Anytime you hear of GQ, think of calcium, which is the hero of contraction of smooth muscles. As for alpha-2, it is anti-sympathetic. What do you mean by anti? It is inhibitory. GI for inhibitory. As for all the betas, they are GS-coupled. And if something is GS-coupled, it will raise the cyclic AMP. What happens when I run from a tiger? Glycogen gets broken down to glucose. Alpha-1 can help me with this glycogenolysis. I break down triglycerides into free fatty acids. Beta, especially beta-3, can help me with this process. I'm gonna dilate my bronchi, which will help me breathe. I'm gonna increase all of my cardiac properties so that I can provide my body with energy while running from a tiger. The sympathetic nervous system constricts almost all of the vessels, except the vessels going to your skeletal muscles, the vessels going to your heart. What does alpha-1 do? Alpha-1 constricts. Remember, alpha-1 is GQ-coupled, and GQ means calcium, which is the hero of contraction of smooth muscles. So I'm gonna contract the smooth muscles in the pupil, especially the dilator pupillae muscle, to dilate the pupil. I'm gonna contract the smooth muscles in the vessels, and by vessels I mean arteries and veins. When I constrict those arterioles, I raise the afterload, which raises the diastolic blood pressure. When I constrict those arterioles, I raise the total peripheral resistance or systemic vascular resistance. So overall, the mean systemic blood pressure goes up. How about constricting veins? When I constrict veins, I increase the venous return back to the heart. This is the right side of the heart. I have right atrium here, right ventricle there, and I have left atrium here, left ventricle there. Remember that the right atrium is connected to superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. By constricting veins, what's going to happen? You're increasing the venous return because you're squeezing them into the right atrium. And this increases venous return, which increases preload, which increases systolic blood pressure because when there is more input to the heart, there will be more output from the heart. Stroke volume goes up and cardiac output goes up. Anytime you constrict veins, what's going to happen to the capacitance of the vein? Well, the capacitance decreases because I'm constricting them and they are emptying their blood into the right atrium. Alpha-1 stimulation tends to reduce renin release from the kidney. Conversely, beta-1 stimulation tends to boost renin release. Alpha-1 decreases renin release, but beta-1 stimulation raises renin release. So what does renin do? Renin is a hormone secreted by the kidney. It's also an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin-1. Angiotensin 1 will be converted to angiotensin 2 thanks to ACE enzyme in the lungs, usually. Angiotensin 2 has two functions. 
Function number one, to vasoconstrict the arterioles and raise the blood pressure. Function number two is to tell the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex to make aldosterone. Aldosterone will reabsorb two things and secrete two things. It will reabsorb sodium and water, but secrete potassium and hydrogen. When you reabsorb sodium and water, you're more likely to raise the blood pressure. So angiotensin two had two functions, to constrict the arterioles, which raises blood pressure, and to secrete aldosterone, which also can raise the blood pressure. Why do you call it angiotensin? Because I tense the angio, I constrict the vessels. Alpha-1 tends to decrease renin, but beta-1 tends to increase renin. How about alpha-2? Alpha-2 is anti-sympathetic, which means if you stimulate this presynaptic alpha-2, what's going to happen? You will release less norepinephrine to the synapse. Remember that the sympathetic nervous system is fight-flight. This is the adrenergic system. It's the land of epinephrine or epinephrine. Don't forget that epinephrine, which is catabolic, is anti-insulin, which is anabolic, which makes sense because alpha-2 stimulation decreases insulin release from the pancreas. So we talked about alpha-1 and alpha-2. Let's talk about the betas. Beta-1, remember your heart. It increases all of the cardiac properties. Positive chronotropic, enotropic, dromotropic. By chronotropic, I mean it increases heart rate. By positive enotropic, I mean it increases contractility. When you contract harder, you pump out more volume, so stroke volume goes up. When stroke volume goes up, cardiac output goes up. When cardiac output goes up, the systolic blood pressure goes up. Beta-1 also increases renin release from the kidney. Beta-1 increases aqueous humor secretion in the eye. And how about beta-2? Remember, you have two lungs. Okay, so it's going to dilate the bronchi. Beta-2 is inhibitory. It relaxes muscle. It relaxes the smooth muscles in my bronchi. It relaxes the smooth muscles of the uterus. And this is called a tocolytic effect. Toco means contraction. Lysis means breakdown. When you break down contractions, you're causing relaxation. When I vasodilate, what's going to happen to the radius of the vessel? It increases, which means what's going to happen to the resistance? It decreases. So the afterload goes down and the diastolic blood pressure tends to decrease and the overall mean systemic blood pressure tends to decrease. Beta 2 do something important, which is they boost the uptake of potassium into the muscle. So here is the muscle and this is the blood vessel. Under beta-2 stimulation, the potassium will leave the blood and go into the cell, such as the muscle cell. Too much beta-2 stimulation can lead to hypokalemia. Beta-2 is important also for metabolism, such as gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. How about beta-3? Oh, that's the land of lipolysis. Break down the triglyceride into free fatty acids and glycerol. And beta-3 is also present in the urinary bladder, Arguably, it relaxes the wall of the bladder. There is something important that we need to mention, which is the beta receptor reflex. Let's suppose that for whatever reason, my blood pressure drops. When my blood pressure drops, the beta receptors, which are the receptors that sense the change in pressure, will sense the hypotension. And they will tell the brain, hey brain, we have a disaster outside. There is low blood pressure, so the brain will sense the danger and will send the sympathetic, it's fight, flight, it's a dangerous situation, I have hypotension. So I send sympathetic fibers. To do what? To release norepinephrine from the nerve fibers. What does norepinephrine do to the heart? It stimulates beta-1, and when you stimulate beta-1, what's going to happen to heart rate? It increases. Stroke volume also increases. That's it? You're only stimulating beta-1? No, as norepinephrine, I can also stimulate alpha-1, so I constrict veins and arteries. When I constrict veins, I increase venous return to the heart, and when I constrict arterioles, I increase the systemic blood pressure. So by increasing heart rate and contractility and increasing venous return and increasing systemic blood pressure, I am trying to raise the blood pressure back to normal. So the moral of the story is hypotension usually causes reflex tachycardia. Conversely, what if I start with hypertension? The opposite will happen. The brain will sense the high pressure and will send the opposite. It will send parasympathetic, the vagus nerve. To do what? To do the opposite. I want to decrease heart rate and decrease contractility so that I can bring the blood pressure down and back to normal. So the moral of the story is hypertension can lead to reflex bradycardia. So hypotension causes reflex tachycardia 
but hypertension causes reflex bradycardia. It's the land of opposites. So what are these adrenergic agonists or sympathomimetics which are the topic of today's video? Remember that we have alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. The alpha-1 agonists include phenylephrine. Alpha-2 agonists include clonidine and alpha-methyldopa. How about a beta-1 agonist? I can say isoproterenol, knowing that isoproterenol is beta-1 and beta-2 agonist. Beta-2 agonists include albuterol, salbutamol, terbutaline. Then we have mixed agonists, which mean they are agonists on alpha and beta, and they include epinephrine or epinephrine and dopamine, collectively known as the catecholamines. And speaking of dopamine, we have something called the D1 receptor. Phenoldopam is a medication that is D1 agonist. And here is another classification. The adrenergic agonists or sympathomimetics include the endogenous natural catecholamines, epinephrine or epinephrine and dopamine, how about catecholamines that are not made in the body? Synthetic catecholamines include isoproterenol and dobutamine. Then we have synthetic non-catecholamines. We have direct acting and indirect acting. Direct acting synthetic non-catecholamines include phenylephrine, methoxamine, albuterol, terbutaline. And for alpha-2, we have clonidine and alpha-methyldopa. I put them together here because they are alpha-2 and because alpha-2 is anti-sympathetic indirect acting meaning they will boost the availability of norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft they include ephedrine amphetamine methenteramine metaraminol cocaine and tricyclic antidepressants here is my pre-synaptic terminal containing norepinephrine here's the synaptic cleft and here's the post-synaptic neuron what do we have here norepinephrine making this an adrenergic fiber Look at my adrenergic fiber, amazing. Now what? I can block the transport into the vesicle, such as reserpine. If I cannot put norepinephrine into the vesicle, I cannot release norepinephrine from the vesicle later. How about I boost the release of norepinephrine, i.e. I'm a releaser. That's the story of amphetamines, tyramine, and ephedrine. How about inhibiting the release, which is the opposite of releaser? Release inhibitors include guanethidine and bretillium. Then norepinephrine is secreted. It can act on alpha-1, which is GQ-coupled, meaning it's going to increase the calcium and contract smooth muscles. Or norepinephrine can act on beta receptors. They are GS-coupled and they will raise the cyclic AMP. So we have alpha agonists and alpha blockers. We have beta agonists and beta blockers. After norepinephrine has performed its function, now what? Now it will be degraded by COMT. We have COMT inhibitors. Or this norepinephrine can undergo reuptake. We have reuptake inhibitors such as tricyclic antidepressants and cocaine. Remember that alpha-2 is antisympathetic. We have alpha-2 agonists which decrease the release of norepinephrine. And we have alpha-2 antagonists which boost the release of norepinephrine. After norepinephrine undergoes reuptake, it can be degraded by MAO enzyme. There is a class of medications known as MAO inhibitors. Guess what's going to happen when I take an MAO inhibitor? I will decrease the degradation of norepinephrine, ending up with more norepinephrine. So we have direct acting agonists, which target one or two receptors. We have mixed agonists, which target many, such as I am alpha-1 and alpha-2 and beta-1 and beta-2 agonists, such as mester epinephrine. Indirect acting, the releasers, the enzyme inhibitors, and the reuptake inhibitors. Some examples of alpha-1 agonists include phenylephrine, metaraminol, mefentermine, and midodrine. And we shall not forget methoxamine. As for alpha-2 agonists, we have clonidine, methyldopa, guanfacine, dexmedetomide, and others. How about beta agonists? I have isoproterenol, beta 1 and beta 2. I have albuterol, which is beta 2. Terbutaline, also beta 2. Dobutamine, formoterol, salmoterol, and metaproterenol. Just like we have isoproterenol, we have metaproterenol too. So this is how I remember them. Isoproterenol with metaproterenol. Okay, we're good. Now what? Dobutamine, not to be confused with dopamine. We're good. Now what? Albuterol, salbutamol, terbutaline, and then the long-acting ones. Formoterol, salmoterol. 
followed by mixed agonists. Epinephrine is an agonist on alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2, depending on the dose. Norepinephrine is mainly alpha-1 agonist and some beta-1. Some alpha-2 exists as well, but not beta-2. So epinephrine acts on beta-2, but norepinephrine does not. How about dopamine? Look at the D. It is D1 agonist, it is beta-1 agonist, and alpha-1 agonist. How about dobutamine? Dobutamine does not touch the D at all. Dobutamine is a beta-1 agonist for the most part. Phenoldopam is a D1, which is dopamine receptor number 1, agonist. Let's start by talking about alpha agonists. They include phenylephrine, methoxamine, and others. Why do we use them? Think about it. If I am an alpha-1 agonist, what's going to happen? You will vasoconstrict. And when I vasoconstrict, what happens to the resistance? The resistance goes up. And what happens to the pressure? The blood pressure goes up. So I can use them for hypotension especially hypotension during spinal anesthesia, postural hypotension, and autonomic insufficiency. What if I have nasal congestion? Theoretically, you can take an alpha-1 agonist to vasoconstrict the vessels. And when I vasoconstrict the vessels, hopefully I'll decrease the congestion because congestion is caused by dilated vessels that secrete mucus. But constricted vessels usually secrete less mucus. What does the sympathetic nervous system do to my pupils? It dilates the pupils. So if I want to dilate the patient pupils, I can use one of these agents. As for the alpha-2 agonists, which are anti-sympathetic, we'll talk about them in the next video, which will be titled Sympatholytics. Beta agonist isoproterenol works on beta 1 and beta 2. Dobutamine is mainly an agonist on beta 1. Albuterol, salbutamol, terbutaline, and the long acting one, salmoterol, formoterol, are beta 2 agonists. If something is beta 2 agonist, what do you think it's gonna do to my bronchi? It will dilate the bronchi, and that's why they can be helpful for asthma patients. What else? Well, beta-2 will dilate or relax the smooth muscles of the uterus. So we use them in precipitous labor or premature labor. Hey, baby, stop, stop, stop. Don't come out yet. So how do we relax the uterus and stop the contractions to colesis? You give something like terbutaline, which is a beta-2 agonist. Next, if something is beta-1 agonist, oh, beta-1 is in the heart, it will increase heart rate and stroke volume so we can benefit from them in some cases of heart failure if i am a beta 1 agonist i will raise the heart rate so you can use me if you have bradycardia and i can also increase heart rate so you can use me if i have heart block which is also bradycardia if something is going to increase heart rate and stroke volume what's going to happen as a side effect tachycardia if it has beta 2 what's going to happen to my vessels remember that beta 2 are inhibitory on everything they relax everything they relax the vessels when i relax the vessels i vasodilate when i vasodilate the vessels in my face i get flushing in my head i get headache all over the body i get hypotension because when i relax the vessel what's going to happen to the radius the radius goes up what's going to happen to resistance resistance goes down and when resistance goes down blood pressure goes down as well beta 1 side effect tachycardia even medications that are mainly beta 2 can have some beta 1 activity so i get anxiety i get palpitations next the big one norepinephrine norepinephrine is a mixed agonist it acts as an agonist on alpha 1 alpha 2 and beta 1 but mainly it's alpha 1 so if I stimulate alpha-1, what's going to happen to my blood vessels? My blood vessels will constrict. So what's going to happen to the radius? Radius decreases. What's going to happen to resistance? Resistance increases. And what's going to happen to the mean systemic arterial blood pressure? It increases. Look, here's the systolic pressure before giving norepinephrine. Here is the diastolic pressure before giving norepinephrine. The difference between them is the pulse pressure. As I give norepinephrine and constrict the vessels, plus increasing the heart rate and stroke volume a little, the systolic blood pressure goes up, the diastolic blood pressure goes up, and the main systemic arterial blood pressure also goes up. How about the pulse pressure? The pulse pressure goes up as well. Why did the systolic blood pressure go up like this? Because it's agonist on beta 1 and alpha 1. Why did the diastolic go up? Because norepi is agonist on alpha 1. Since norepi is agonist on beta 1, what's going to happen? I can get increased heart rate after the administration of norepinephrine. However, why is the rise in heart rate not huge? Because anytime you raise your blood pressure, 
you stimulate your baroreceptors, triggering a vagal response, and the vagus will try to lower the heart rate. And that's why the heart rate does not increase a lot. And in some cases, the reflex bradycardia can even win. When you say that norepinephrine is agonist in alpha-1, is it constricting arteries or constricting veins? The answer is both. It is constricting almost every vessel in your body except the coronary arteries. In fact, norepinephrine and epinephrine tend to dilate the coronary. I mean, think about it. If you're exercising and you have a wonderful, healthy heart, when you run, that's sympathetic world, so fight, flight. What happens? Epinephrine and norepinephrine get released from my adrenal medulla. Do you think your coronary arteries will constrict or dilate? Well, since my heart needs more oxygen when I exercise, I better dilate the coronary arteries, proving that norepinephrine and epinephrine do not constrict the coronaries. Okay, norepinephrine, you will constrict arterioles and veins. Let's constrict arterioles. What's going to happen to the afterload? It increases. What happens to diastolic blood pressure? It increases. What happens to the total peripheral resistance? It also increases. Anytime you raise the blood pressure, you might trigger a better receptor reflex. And when you constrict veins, what's going to happen? More venous return will return to the right side of the heart. So what's going to happen to preload? Preload goes up and diastolic volume goes up. And therefore, there'll be more volume in the heart to pump more. So, systolic blood pressure goes up. Anytime you constrict veins, what happens to their compliance? Well, since compliance is similar to distensibility or extensibility or capacitance, the moment I constrict my veins, I decrease the compliance, I decrease expansibility, I decrease distensibility, and I decrease the capacitance of the veins. What is compliance again? Compliance is the change in volume over the change in pressure. When I constrict my venules, the volume decreases. When the volume decreases, the compliance decreases. All of this was the effect of norepinephrine alpha-1, which predominates at higher dose. But what's the effect of norepinephrine on beta-1? It increases enotropy, dromotropy, chronotropy. It increases contractility and therefore stroke volume and therefore raises the systolic blood pressure. It increases the conduction velocity and it increases heart rate. Please note that we use norepinephrine to treat hypotension because as you see, it raises the blood pressure. We can use norepinephrine after coronary artery bypass graft because usually after coronary artery bypass graft, the vessels dilate and the blood pressure drops. To prevent this, we give norepinephrine to raise the total peripheral resistance. What if I have septic shock? Well, septic shock has hypotension. Can we benefit from norepi? Absolutely. We need to constrict those dilated vessels. What's the name of shock that happens in sepsis? Is it hypovolemic shock? Is it cardiogenic shock? Is it obstructive shock or distributive shock? Please comment below. Please note that norepinephrine does not act on beta-2 for the most part, and that's why it has very minimal metabolic effect, which means it's not gonna break down glycogen into glucose, and it's not gonna raise your blood sugar. When I give you norepinephrine by injection, it's a very acidic medication. So we usually dilute it in a 5% glucose solution, which means if I give you 100 ml of solution with the norepinephrine, I will add 5 milligrams grams of glucose to it so that it's 5 over 100 or 5 percent. Some side effects of norepi. During infusion, extravasation can occur. Norepinephrine is a potent vasoconstrictor. Oh, when I vasoconstrict the vessels, there will be less blood going to the cells, which means less oxygenated blood reaching the cell, and the cell will die from ischemia i.e. necrosis. So how should I mitigate this? Try not to inject norepinephrine locally, but to inject it in a big vein through a central venous line, which is connected to the right atrium. Because the right atrium is your central vein, because it connects to the biggest veins in your body, the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, making the right atrium the central vein. That's why we call the pressure in the right atrium central venous pressure. What happens to blood pressure when I give norepi? Blood pressure goes up because I constricted the arterioles. And that's why it's important to monitor the patient. 
Norepinephrine also constricts veins, increasing the venous return. That's why we should be very careful if I have right ventricular failure. Because if the right ventricle fails, i.e. cannot contract, and you overwhelm it with more blood, you will make the matter worse. So you gotta be cautious. Norepinephrine is a constrictor on arteries and veins, so I increase the total peripheral resistance or systemic vascular resistance and the pulmonary vascular resistance, and this will increase the pulmonary artery pressure. Norepi acts on beta 1, raising the heart rate, and this so much constriction can lead to what? Hypoperfusion, organ ischemia, and organ damage. And when the cell is toast without oxygen, it will shift to anaerobic glycolysis. Anaerobic glycolysis secretes lactic acid, so I develop lactic acidosis, which causes high anion gap metabolic acidosis. How should I mitigate this effect? Well, well, well. If norepinephrine can lead to ischemia and decrease blood supply to the cell, why don't you pump more volume? Oh, I don't get it. Remember that pressure equals force over area. That's true. If you give norepinephrine alone, you constrict vessels. What happens to the surface area? The surface area decreases and the pressure increases because the resistance went up. However, if I increase the fluids or the force by giving you more fluids with the norepinephrine, you will mitigate this effect and you will end up with less resistance. One of the organs that is particularly vulnerable to ischemia and end organ damage is the kidney because there is a rule that says if there is no BP, i.e. perfusion to the kidney, there will be no PP, i.e. no urine formation. This is classic pre-renal azotemia, which is a subtype of acute renal failure. The patient can suffer from oliguria, less urine formation, or anuria, no urine. The kidney without robust perfusion is screwed. Forgive my language. We're done with norepinephrine. Let's talk about epinephrine. Epinephrine is only made by your adrenal medulla, not by the nerve endings. Epinephrine acts on alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. It is a mixed agonist. However, this depends on the dose. At lower doses, epinephrine acts like isoproterenol, mainly an agonist on beta-1 and beta-2. But at high dose of epinephrine, epinephrine acts like norepinephrine, meaning mainly on alpha-1 and some alpha-2 and beta-1. So epinephrine at low dose, beta-1 agonist and beta-2 agonist. If it's beta-1 agonist, it will increase all of the cardiac properties like heart rate, conduction velocity, and contractility, raising the stroke volume and the systolic blood pressure. Anytime you raise the blood pressure, you will trigger a better receptor reflex and get reflex bradycardia. Epinephrine is an agonist in beta-2, dilating my bronchi, improving my asthma symptoms. It also relaxes the uterine muscle wall. And it's not just relaxing the muscles in the uterus and the muscles in the bronchi, but also the smooth muscles in the blood vessel. Decreasing the systemic vascular resistance, lowering the afterload, decreasing the diastolic blood pressure, and to a certain extent, it might lower the blood pressure. But norepinephrine did not have any beta-2 function, and that's why norepinephrine can never lower my blood pressure. However, epinephrine can lower my blood pressure. Next, epinephrine acts on beta-2, which is similar to beta-3, so we can get lipolysis or breakdown of lipids into free fatty acids and glycerol. We can break down glycogen into glucose. Hashtag glycogenolysis. So it boosts glycogenolysis and lipolysis. How did it boost glycogenolysis? By stimulating the enzyme phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase breaks down my glycogen. How do you break down the triglycerides? By activating triglyceride lipase and other lipases. At high dose, however, epinephrine is similar to norepinephrine. It acts mainly on alpha-1 and then some alpha-2 and some beta-1. How can we differentiate between epinephrine and norepinephrine? Remember that norepinephrine did not have beta-2 agonism, but epinephrine is a beta-2 agonist. So the way to uncover this is to block the alpha-1. Let's block the alpha-1. So epinephrine now cannot act on alpha-1 and neither can nor epi. Okay, who's gonna remain? The betas? Epi will act on beta-1 and beta-2. Nor epi will act only on beta-1. Which means which one of these two is more likely to dilate my vessels and lower my blood pressure? Only epinephrine. 
but norepinephrine can not lower my blood pressure. Recall that in the beginning of this lecture, we talked about the fact that epinephrine is similar to glucagon and cortisol and thyroxine, and all of these are anti-insulin. So it makes sense that if you stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, you will inhibit insulin release. I mean, look at this. When I break down glycogen, do you think insulin approves this? No. When I break down fat, does insulin like this? No. One last time, epinephrine at low dose is similar to isoproterenol, meaning it's beta-1 agonist and beta-2 agonist. Epinephrine at an intermediate dose is an alpha-1 agonist and beta-2 agonist. At high dose, it's just like norepi, mainly alpha-1 and some alpha-2 and beta-1. And that's why the effects on hemodynamics will be slightly different. Put differently, beta predominates at lower dose, but alpha predominates at higher doses. What are the clinical uses of epinephrine and norepinephrine? Usually epinephrine is used as an adjunct to local anesthetics. When I give the local anesthetics, I want them to remain local and not to spread via bloodstream to other parts of the body. I want them to remain local, okay? If you want them to remain local, then constrict the vessel local. If you constrict the vessels locally, the anesthetic will not escape. It will remain here locally. That's why we give epinephrine as an adjunct to local anesthetics to prolong the effects of the local anesthetic. Also, if I have shock, such as septic shock, blood pressure drops. So what should you do? Give me epinephrine or norepinephrine to raise my blood pressure. It does not have to be septic shock. It could be anaphylactic shock or any other shock. And in the patient with shock, we also give intravenous fluids. What if I have a cardiac arrest or cardiac block? Well, epinephrine or epinephrine can increase heart rate, contractility and conduction, so we can give epinephrine or norepinephrine. Now, the following is only true for epinephrine and not norepinephrine. If I have anaphylactic shock, which usually means shock and I cannot breathe because of the bronchoconstriction, epinephrine is preferred because epinephrine has beta-2, which will dilate my bronchi, but norepinephrine does not dilate bronchi. Next, if I have asthma, like status asthmaticus, should I benefit more from epi or norepi? Epi. Why? Same thing. I dilate my bronchi with epi, not norepi, because epi is agonist on beta 2. There you go. Epinephrine. What do you do? Well, I can dilate your pupil because I am alpha 1 agonist causing midriasis. And I am alpha 1 agonist as well. I can constrict blood vessels, hypoperfusion, the kidney is sad, no BP, no PP, or no perfusion, no PP, so I get oliguria or anuria. The hypoperfusion to the kidney caused by epinephrine can be stronger than that of norepinephrine. Tachyphylaxis does not exist for epinephrine. What is tachyphylaxis? It means that the more doses I give you, the less the effect that I get. Oh, so it is kind of adaptation. That's true. It's adaptation, acclimatization. The more you give, the less you get. But epinephrine does not have that. If I give epinephrine again and again and again, there is no reduction in effect with repeated doses. And that's why, let's say that I'm allergic to peanuts and I ate something that had peanuts. I developed anaphylactic shock. Epinephrine can rescue me today, tomorrow, next year, next decade, etc. My body will never get used to it. This is not the case with other synthetic non-catecholamines. They have some tachyphylaxis. Epinephrine broke down the big sugar, glycogen, into glucose, so there is more glucose in the blood. It broke down the fat in the fat stores into free fatty acids and glycerol in the blood, so the fat in the blood will increase. LDL increases in the blood, phospholipids increase, lactate increase, insulin decreases because epinephrine belongs to the glucagon world, not the insulin world. Epinephrine increases all of the cardiac properties, which increases myocardial oxygen consumption. Side effects of epinephrine. If you increase my cardiac properties a lot and you increase the myocardial oxygen consumption a lot, I can get acute heart failure. I can get pulmonary edema from the acute heart failure. I can get arrhythmias from the tachycardia. I can get hypertension and the increased myocardial oxygen consumption can make me run out of oxygen, leading to myocardial ischemia. 
An important pharmacology fact, remember the normal sodium potassium ATPase, what does it do? Well, it exists in every cell. It pushes sodium out of the cell and pushes potassium into the cell. So normally potassium is going in. If I take a beta agonist, I stimulate the sodium potassium ATPase, so it works harder pushing more sodium to the outside and more potassium to the inside. Lots of potassium is entering the cell, less potassium is left in the blood, I get hypokalemia when I take a beta agonist. Conversely, if I take a beta blocker, I block the sodium potassium ATPase. Sodium will no longer be able to leave and potassium will be no longer able to get in. So all of that potassium will remain outside causing hyperkalemia. So if I take propranolol, metoprolol, or any other olol, I risk developing hyperkalemia. Beta agonists cause hypokalemia, but beta blockers cause hyperkalemia for the most part. Hey, dopamine, what do you do? I act on D1 receptor, which dilates vessel. Remember, D1 dilates. It dilates renal vessels, mesenteric vessels, and coronary vessels. D1 receptors are GS coupled. If you are GS coupled, you will stimulate adenylate cyclase, convert ATP to cyclic AMP, activate protein kinase A, which causes vasodilation of smooth muscles. Everything here is A. Adenylate cyclase, ATP, cyclic AMP, protein kinase A, dilate the smooth muscles. Who else is GS coupled? Remember, beta 1, GS coupled. Beta 2, GS coupled. Beta 3, GS coupled. And D1 is also GS coupled. This was true for dopamine at low dose. Dopamine at medium dose increases all of the cardiac properties because it starts to act on beta 1, which is also GS coupled, increases cyclic AMP. Next, we have high dose of dopamine. It acts on D1, beta 1, and look at this, alpha 1 appears raising my blood pressure. That's why we can give dopamine to manage a patient in shock with hypotension, and we can give phenoldopam to dilate vessels and lower my blood pressure. Phenoldopam is a D1 agonist. Next, ephedrine. How do you work? Well, direct acting and indirect acting. At the end of the day, I raise norepinephrine. Lots of norepinephrine will act on alpha receptors, raising my blood pressure. Act on beta receptor, raise all of the cardiac properties. Can the monoamine oxidase enzyme present in my gut metabolize ephedrine? The answer is no. So can I give it orally? Yes, I can. Have you ever heard of oral epinephrine? No. How about oral norepinephrine? No. How about oral ephedrine? Yes. It's not metabolized by your gastric or intestinal Now, ephedrine has slow inactivation and slow excretion, so it stays longer in your body. It has long duration. Can it lead to hyperglycemia? Not really. Can it cause acidosis? Yes, even more acidosis than the drug that we'll discuss soon, which is phenylephrine, which is alpha-1 agonist. Can it dilate my bronchi? Sure, it is beta agonist. Can it act as a decongestant? Let's try to figure out the mechanism. If it's alpha-1 agonist, it will constrict blood vessels. And if it constricts blood vessels, it decreases congestion. Ephedrine is one of these synthetic homies, so it has tachyphylaxis, which means reduction in effect with repeated doses. Phenylephrine, another synthetic homie, synthetic non-catecholamine, less potent than norepi. Phenylephrine is mainly an alpha-1 agonist at lower dose. At high dose, expect some alpha-2 agonist. Alpha-1 constricts vessels and raises my blood pressure. Anytime blood pressure goes up, beta receptor reflex gets triggered to do the opposite, to try to decrease blood pressure by having reflex bradycardia. So hypertension and reflex bradycardia. Sometimes during administration of anesthesia or during surgery, the patient's blood pressure drops. Now, can we reverse this? Sure, give phenylephrine. Phenylephrine is alpha-1 agonist. It will raise the blood pressure back to normal. Phenylephrine might be helpful to patients with coronary artery disease because it improves coronary perfusion, just like epi and norepi. You can give phenylephrine with nitric oxide to improve oxygenation. Both of them improve coronary perfusion. And it depends on the vessel because phenylephrine can decrease blood flow to some vessels in the kidney, viscera, and skin, but increase blood flow to vessels in the coronaries and the pulmonary artery. And this is one of the reasons it improves oxygenation. What if I gave too much phenylephrine, which is alpha-1 agonist? How can I resolve this? 
give an alpha-1 blocker or an alpha blocker such as fintolamine. In the next video, we'll talk about fintolamine and phenoxybenzamine. Quick review on phosphodiesterase inhibitors, also known as enodilators. Why eno? Because they increase contractility. Why dilators? Because they cause vasodilation. Remember that if something is GQ coupled, such as alpha-1 receptors, GQ equals calcium equals contraction of smooth muscles, subbronchoconstriction, vasoconstriction, constriction of sphincters, contraction of uterus, etc. But beta-1, beta-2, beta-3, D1, and others are GS coupled, which means everything is A. Adenylate cyclase, convert ATP to cyclic AMP, activate protein kinase A to do what? When it comes to cardiac muscles, I'm going to boost contractility. When it comes to smooth muscles, I will relax them. I will dilate them. Vasodilation, bronchodilation, uterus muscle relaxation. Beta 1 on the kidney increases renin and in the eye increases aqueous humor. So we talked about ATP. ATP by adenylate cyclase with the A will give me cyclic AMP, also A. All right, cyclic AMP does what? bronchodilation, vasodilation, and increase cardiac contractility and heart rate. Oh, then after cyclic AMP performs this function, we degrade it into pieces of trash or degradation products. Who degraded cyclic AMP? Phosphodiesterase. And we have many types of phosphodiesterase and many medications that inhibit phosphodiesterase. So let's say that I took theophylline or melrinone or amrinone, or any of these phosphodiesterase inhibitors, I'll inhibit phosphodiesterase, raising the cyclic AMP, which will relax my vessels, relax my bronchi, increase heart rate and contractility, depending on the type and the location of the phosphodiesterase. So when I inhibit phosphodiesterase, cyclic AMP goes up because it's not degraded and it will cause bronchodilation and vasodilation, it will increase heart rate and contractility. Here is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, inhibits the degradation of cyclic AMP, so cyclic AMP increases. So this is similar to beta agonists, because beta agonists also raise cyclic AMP. A phosphodiesterase inhibitor raises cyclic AMP. What's the effect of cyclic AMP on different parts of the body? Well, when it comes to cardiac muscles, I increase cardiac contractility. But when it comes to smooth muscles, I decrease their contraction. I dilate vessels, I dilate bronchi. When cyclic AMP increases, platelet aggregation decreases. It's also anti-inflammatory, decreases your triglycerides, and increases your HDL, the so-called good cholesterol. Cyclic AMP is doozy. Think that you're running on a treadmill. Your heart is increasing its contractility, but your vessels are dilating to perfuse the heart by dilating the coronary and to perfuse the skeletal muscles. Next, quick review of nitric oxide. What does nitric oxide do? It activates guanylate cyclase, not adenylate cyclase. Everything here is G instead of A. Guanylate cyclase, GTP gets converted to cyclic GMP, activates protein kinase G, which activates phosphatase, which breaks down myosin light chain phosphate into myosin light chain, i.e. I remove the phosphate. When I remove the phosphate, I will inactivate the myosin light chain, i.e. relax it. So nitric oxide relaxes the smooth muscles. In blood vessels, including the blood vessels of erectile tissue, hydralazine, nitroprusside, and nitrates act similar to nitric oxide. How about sildenafil, tadenafil, vardenafil? Ooh, Cialis, Viagra. How do they work? They inhibit phosphodiesterase 5, decreasing the degradation of cyclic GMP. So I'll have more cyclic GMP and more dilation, more relaxation of smooth muscles, which means more dilation and more erection. And that's why it will be a disaster to take one of these medications with one of these medications, because if I take them together, I dilate too much. And when I dilate too much, what's going to happen to the radius? Radius goes up, resistance goes down, blood pressure goes down, and I can die from severe hypotension. Never ever combine a nitrate with a sildenafil. Can we take a moment to admire all the medications that can raise cyclic AMP? Sure. How about the phosphodiesterase inhibitors? They can do it. 
Sildenafil, Tadenafil, Vardenafil, Amrinone, Melrinone, Enamrinone, Theophylline, Xanthine, Caffeine, Silostazole, Dipyridamol, all of them can do it. How about norepinephrine and epinephrine? They are beta-1 agonists, and beta-1 is GS-coupled, which means it's going to raise uh, cyclic MP. Isoproteranol, dopamine, dobutamine. All of these raise cyclic MP. What's going to happen to my heart? Increase all cardiac properties. Heart rate and contractility. Heart rate and stroke volume. And what's going to happen to the kidney? It will secrete more renin, which will raise my blood pressure. And what's going to happen to the smooth muscles? Dilation, relaxation, bronchodilation, and vasodilation. When I take a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, the cyclic AMP will go up. Cyclic AMP goes up, meaning relaxation of smooth muscles. Oh, so the veins will relax and their capacitance will increase. So the blood will pile up in my veins. If blood is piling up more in my veins, it is not reaching the right atrium. It is not reaching my central vein. So what's going to happen to the central venous pressure? It decreases. The blood is piling up in my veins. It's not returning to the right atrium. So venous return decreases. And the pulmonary vascular resistance is decreasing as well because I'm relaxing the vessels. When you relax the vessels, the radius goes up, but the resistance goes down, just like that. What else do phosphodiesterase inhibitors do? They boost cardiac contractility, leaving less fluid or less blood accumulating in the ventricle. So the left ventricular end diastolic pressure decreases. Less blood accumulating in the left ventricle means less blood accumulating in my left atrium. So the left atrial pressure, i.e. the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, decreases. How do they do this? By boosting cardiac contractility. So cardiac contractility increases, stroke volume increases, cardiac output increases, heart rate increases. What does cyclic AMP do to blood vessels? It relaxes blood vessels. When you relax blood vessels, the resistance decreases and the blood pressure can decrease as well. Look at this, amrinone, melrinone, and amrinone. How do they work? They inhibit phosphodiesterase 3, which means cyclic AMP will not be broken down. Increased cyclic AMP will lead to activation of protein kinase A, because everything here is A. I will open the calcium channels in the cardiac myocyte, which means more calcium will rush into the cardiac muscles. Calcium induced, calcium release. Calcium is the hero of contraction. So I get increased contractility. And that's how amrinone, melrinone, and enamrinone can boost cardiac contractility and increase the stroke volume, which increases the cardiac output, which may increase my blood pressure. So amrinone, enamrinone, melrinone make my ventricle contract stronger. When I contract stronger, I get rid of all of that blood, I eject that blood quickly. So less blood will accumulate in my right atrium, and my right atrial pressure will decrease, okay? So less pressure here, less pressure in the right ventricle, less pressure in the pulmonary artery, so my pulmonary artery pressure will also decrease. However, amrinone, enamrinone, melrinone are increasing contractility. What happens to cardiac output? Increases. What happens to the cardiac index, which is a type of cardiac output? It increases. How about the left ventricle stroke index? It increases. Left ventricular ejection fraction? It increases. When you pump blood stronger, you will have less blood accumulating in the left ventricle. So what's going to happen to left ventricular end diastolic pressure? It decreases. Less blood accumulating in the left ventricle means less blood will pile up in the left atrium. So what's going to happen to the left atrial pressure or the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? It decreases. And what's going to happen to the systemic vascular resistance? Usually decreases. Because remember, when I increase cyclic AMP, I dilate the vessels. So hypotension is more common than hypertension. So now I want you to pause and review. Here are the answers. Remember that the half-life of amrinone is about three hours. There is no tachyphylaxis here, just like epinephrine. It gets metabolized in the liver by N-acetylation and glucoirinidation. Remember in the last video, when we talked about anti-seizure medications, we talked about pharmacokinetics, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. The metabolism of amrinone occurs in the liver. Amrinone and amrinone do two things. They boost cardiac contractility and they lower blood pressure. So they are beneficial in cardiac surgery, 
coronary artery bypass graft because in many of these cases, there is vasospasm. Oh, oh, I do not want vasospasm. I want to dilate the vessels and lower the resistance. That's when amrinone or enamrinone might be beneficial. Side effects. If you dilate too much, you drop the blood pressure. They can decrease platelet aggregation because they boost cyclic AMP and they can lead to cardiac arrhythmias because they increase the stroke volume too much. And let's put everything together here in this table. These are the sympathomimetics. In the next video in this pharmacology playlist, we shall talk about sympatholytics. Please take a moment to pause and review the name of each medication and the mechanism of actions. Very important. Quick review of the medications. Methyl P tyrosine prevents the synthesis of neurotransmitters. Reserpine prevents the entry of the norepinephrine into the vesicle. Bertillium and guanithidine prevents the release of the neurotransmitter. Amphetamine and tyramines are the opposite. They boost the release of the norepinephrine. Tricyclic antidepressants and cocaine prevent the reuptake of norepinephrine. They are reuptake inhibitors. MAO inhibitors prevent the metabolism of norepinephrine. COMT inhibitors are similar. The alpha agonist, beta agonist, etc. They act on the postsynaptic receptors. In the next video, we'll talk about alpha blockers and beta blockers. Do you want to learn more about pharmacology? I have the full pharmacology set on my website, metacosisperfectionalis.com, such as my cardiac pharmacology course, which will teach you about antiarrhythmics, antihypertensives, diuretics, and the Toxin. I have an autonomic pharmacology course, which will teach you about acetylcholine, bethanicol, atropine, and much more. I also have endocrine pharmacology, antibiotics pharmacology, neuropharmacology, general pharmacology, and much more. There are more than 300 premium videos on this channel available to you when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, click the join button, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo, go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you would like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.